Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We are your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to the I Create Daily podcast, a movement for creators serious about their art. I'm Devani. And I'm Leora. And our guest today is David Perry. David has been a pharmacist for nearly 30 years, but he's always had an interest in writing fiction. David began his first novel around 2000, but life happened and that first draft was abandoned to the nether regions of a bottom drawer. Then, in 2006, while cleaning out his desk, David unearthed that abandoned manuscript and with it his dream of becoming a published author. Today, David has published three books all together, all while working full-time in his career as a pharmacist. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Was that right? It was about 2000 when you, first, when you started your first novel? Uh, that's about, that's correct. I, I don't remember the exact year when that all happened, but yeah, I started working on it. Um, then I was married and had a child and, um, parental influences and husbandly influences became a factor. So it, 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 it ended up in the bottom drawer of a filing cabinet. Right. Definitely. And then something inspired you when, well, when you found it, you know, you sort of reignited and touched back into that dream of being uh, a writer, a fiction writer. Had you, when do you remember first becoming interested in the idea of being a fiction writer? Was that something in your childhood or was that something that happened as an adult? It actually happened when I was in college. I remember the exact moment and day when I thought about being a writer. I was in my second year of pharmacy school. That was way back in 1981. Um, and I was in the student lounge reading a novel by Robert Ludlum. I was a big, I'm a big fan of his. I've read every novel he's ever written. Of course, he's passed away now. Um, and as I read a particular scene, I just said, I would like to do this. The way he could capture characters and the way he described scenes. And um, he just drew me in and I said, I just was sucked into his novels. And I said, I'd really like to give this a try took me several years before I got around to doing it, but he's always been a big influence of mine. Wonderful. That's really wonderful. And we love so much about your story because one of the uh, websites actually that are in our portfolio of sites is a site called Bloomers Reinvented. And what we you know, have come to see and recognize are people like yourself who, so many of whom shelved their earlier dreams you know, and yet now in their second half of life have a chance to basically reignite that and get back to it, you know, with renewed zeal and yes. as well as so much more substance of talent and life experience. So it's great to see you doing that. Yes, yes. It's, um, it was, it, you know, the, the first time I saw my, my first book and I, I got open that first case of hardcover novels that I brought home. And I saw my words in print. It was very, very emotional. It was a very humbling experience. I was moved to tears because I had worked so hard on that novel. Oh, yes. I think over the course of seven or eight years, it took me to finally get it to print. Um, and once you accomplish a task like that, it's just incredibly, incredibly rewarding. It is. Absolutely. And, and then it also, you know, sort of it lights that fire, it fuels the fire of desire to do more, and also to speed it up, you know, which you have done because you have, you know, so, so your, your, your first manuscript was actually your second published. Because, Correct. So like, tell us out, tell us, walk us through that journey just a little bit, how those things unfolded. And all while you were being a pharmacist, pharmacist full time, and a husband and dad, right? Yes, that's correct. Um, my first novel, the book that was published second, which was actually my first manuscript, was originally called Significant Deviation. It's about a pharmacist who discovers um, uh, medication errors going on in his hospital. And he investigates and discovers that people are manipulating medications. And um, without giving away too much of the plot, it, he's investigating uh, basically uh, corruption and deceit and murder. Um, 
But for some reason, after I started the manuscript, I guess about four months in, for, I lost my motivation with regards to that. So I put it down and I set it aside. Um, and that's the manuscript that actually sat in the filing cabinet for all those years. And then once the, uh, the bug re-hit me, um, I started my uh, second manuscript, which was actually the first book that was published, which is um, called The Cyclops Conspiracy. Um, and, you know, one of the things that prompted me to retake, take up the, um, the, the business of writing again was because um, I got divorced from my, my son's mom. And it's very interesting. Uh, it was a very amicable divorce. Um, but when I woke up one morning, I realized I had a lot more free time on my hands. Um, so I just started writing and I actually became uh, somewhat of a recluse for about two and a half years as I sat down and I wrote every day. Um, and after about a thousand pages, I was done uh, with that first manuscript. So it was, um, and I was just enthralled with uh, the, the, the project, the process, the pro process of writing. And just, um, I was, I was captivated, but I still am. I still am. Uh, I woke up every day after I came home. And when I came home from work, I would promise myself that I would write at least two pages. Uh, and I'd get up early in the morning before my shift started. And I would say, I'm going to write one page today, or I'm going to write five pages on my day off. And before you know it, it was, it was done. It was done. It was incredibly, it's a lot of work. It's uh, um, you have to have a lot of dedication uh, you have to be able to accept criticism, uh, but you can't ever give up. You have to really, really believe in yourself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And, and you were mentioning, so you wrote every day, you woke up early, you, okay, you wrote after work and was your goal one page each day? What was that like your habit, your daily habit for writing just one page each day? And obviously when you get into the flow of writing, that one page can easily turn into, you know, three, four or five, but what, because uh, a lot of people, they're like, I'm going to write this, I'm going to do this, and then they get into it, and that just kind of falls flat after a little while. So how did you, did you have any accountability system? Like, what kept you, what kept you motivated? Well, I did, I did have a motivational uh, deadline or a, um, something that I needed to do every day. If I was working on a particular day, I would try to wake up in the morning uh, and say to myself, I'm going to write one page before I go to work. Uh, if it was my day off, I'd sit down and say, I'm going to write 10 pages today, or I'm going to write 20 pages today. And as you all uh, probably understand, the creative process sometimes doesn't always flow when you want it to flow. The creative juices kind of come when they want to come. So some days I'd wake up at five o'clock in the morning and I'd say, I'm going to write one page. And before I knew it, I was into my fifth or sixth page and I look at the clock and then I realize I have to get ready for work and take a shower and do all that. And other days on my day off, when I'm, I'm really pumped up to get 10 or 15 pages done, uh, it's like a blank slate. There's nothing that comes from that. So, um, and, and if, if I was on a day off and I happen to write two pages, then I wrote two pages. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing to do is to make sure that you have a personal accountability calendar and say, this is what I'm going to do today. And just as a side note, one of the things I've found in my writing process is that if I develop a little bit of a writer's block uh, and I don't know what to write, it usually stems from the fact that I, I haven't quite done enough research mm -hmm. or on a particular scene. So if I have a particular character that I'm writing about or a particular scene I'm writing about and it's not flowing, I'll just put down my pen or I'll put down the computer and, and I'll just go off and look at whatever is going on. If it's a scene, a local scene, I'll go over there and I'll sit there and I'll look at it and things start flowing. The creative juices start flowing. So uh, that's just a little, little side note. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. Yeah. It's getting, because a lot of times, you know, very rarely do people say that they had their best idea sitting at their desk. You right, know, usually, yeah. <laughs> usually it's in the shower or on a walk or like you said, at a coffee shop in a venue away from your normal routine. So, but one of the things you said intrigued me, have, did you find that you were tended to be more productive when you had less time, like when it was not a free day or was that just the occasional fluke? Um, I would say that's probably the occasional fluke. Another, another key, and I'm, I read this in one of my books that I read about writing is 
one author, and I can't remember who it, who it was, said that if you stop writing before you're done that particular day, uh, if you leave yourself with a thought hanging, the next time you come back to, to pick up that thought, usually the, ju the, the creative juices flow a little easier. So I've tended to try to do that. If I, if I finish a scene on a particular day and then I have to pick up a new scene the following day, sometimes it's a little harder to pick it up. Yeah. So I try to leave something hanging for the next day and that usually helps. So the, to answer your question, um, nowadays the, 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 the writer's block or, or not having something to write about are, are getting fewer and far between. Right. That's such an interesting point because, you know, there's that an age old debate of is writer's block real? Is it fake? Is it just, you know, that, that whole like some people are like, yes, writer block is a real struggle and others are like, no, get over it and write. And what I find interesting is that it seems like there's a lot of creative people who the longer that they have a developed creative habit where they show up daily or just at some consistent level, the less they experience a creative block. And so have you found that, I guess, obviously you've found that because it happens less? I would say that's the case. I would, I think that the, the, the creative process, especially as it relates to writing, and I assume it would relate to anything else, whether it be painting or singing or playing the piano, um, is, is I, I believe it's a learned process and that it's not something that, you know, necessarily just comes naturally. You have to work at it. So if you develop your techniques and you develop your, your routines, uh, yes, I believe that, that you can minimize your downtime, so to speak. Definitely. So I love the title of your second series, the, the Cyclops Conspiracy, uh, followed by the Cyclops Revenge, which releases officially in February, which is probably when this episode is going to air. So we'll coordinate that for sure. Um, and that's a great name. So how did you come up with that name is part one of the question. And part two is why did you decide to write it to put your first manuscript on hold and move to the Cyclops and then back to the other? Well, I think when I originally put the first manuscript down, that um, that that manuscript, which is my second book, which is second called Second Chance, and I'm going to do a little advertising here. That's what it looks like. Can you um, hold, it up, hold it up. Put it. Hold it up here, again. Here. Yeah. Hold it up. You see it? Higher. Yeah. Higher. Higher. There you go. There you go. Awesome. Okay. okay. Great. This was actually my first manuscript. That this is the book that was originally entitled uh, Significant Deviation. But I realized after discussing it with some uh, marketing folks that significant deviation has way too, ma too many letters to put on the cover <laughs> of a book. So we had to change the title, so we called it Second Chance. Um, but this was the first book, the, the first manuscript that I put down. But it's interesting and, that it's called Second Chance, and it was your first manuscript that you kind of put on a shelf and oh, or in a drawer, and you published it second, even <laughs> though it was your first manuscript. Yeah, you know, I had never I have never considered that until you said that. So I guess maybe that's some poetic justice there. Yeah, yeah. Um, go ahead. So this is the first book. This was this is the Cyclops Conspiracy. This was my first published novel. This is the book that I, you know, was brought to tears when I first opened the case of books. Um, it was originally entitled The Pettigrew Files, um, but the marketing folks decided that they liked something better. They consulted with me on, on it. They gave me a list of about ten, eight or ten different titles, and The Cyclops Conspiracy uh, was the one that we decided on. Now, Cyclops in the in the book and in the story is a particular machine, which I can't go into a whole lot of detail uh, without ruining the, the story, is a machine that's involved in the plot, um, and they call it the Cyclops. Um, so that's how that, that came about. But it's uh, very interesting because the way I wrote the story and um, something that happens with one of the antagonists in the first story, he loses an eye. And it kind of uh, it kind of flows with the Cyclops theory and the Cyclops um, the, from the Greek mythology. Um, so it became it's become a series. Um, uh, the Cyclops conspiracy um, ends with some questions that are left hanging, um, and so we pick it up in the second book, which is the Cyclops Revenge, uh, which again is coming out uh, February first. And here's um, here's what it looks like. Um, 
And now one of the things that I have always wanted to do, I have my own publishing company. So I publish these books through my publishing company. Oh, wonderful. I market through uh, a company called uh, Bookmasters. They also warehouse the books for me out in Ohio, um, which allows me to have my product put into the bricks and mortar bookstores like Barnes and Noble and Books a Million. It's also available on Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble online. Um, so it allows me a lot of national exposure and to some degree, a little bit of international exposure. Um, the, and so I hope I answered your question. I think I've kind of gotten off on a tangent, oh, but no, that's okay. the it's Cyclops right. title comes from uh, a device that was in the first book. And then because one of the characters loses an eye, we've kind of transitioned to the Cyclops in, in Greek mythology. Right. Okay. So, so the other part of the question was how did you decide to like you, so you published the Cyclops conspiracy in 2012, right? Right. Correct. And then in 2013, you published second chance. Right. So, and, and now here we are 2018 is like time has flown, right? Like how did that time get away? And thankfully your second one is coming out and actually your, your, yeah, the second of the, of the conspiracies, uh, sorry, the Cyclops series. How did you decide to go from, uh, to, to second chance next rather than writing the next Cyclops. Okay. I, I understand. I remember now the question. Sorry. Um, after I finished the Cyclops conspiracy, I really decided that I wanted that first manuscript to, to be published. And it was a significant portion of it was done after I had um, already finished the Cyclops conspiracy. So I picked it up and I said, we're going to knock this out. I had made all my mistakes in terms of, writing and editing and things that I had to learn about the writing process when I was writing the Cyclops conspiracy. So um, the second chance book, getting that to market and, and getting that published was a lot quicker because I, as I said, I had made a, a lot, all my mistakes with the first book. Um, and I'm still, still learning every book that you write, you learn something new about what you can do better, um, how you can plot your stories better, um, so the second chance happened a lot faster um, once I had published the first book. The reason I uh, um, had put down second chance is because I needed to learn how to plot my stories better. Um, I consulted with an editor about on con uh, the Cyclops conspiracy, and he taught me a lot about the way to start your scenes, the way to finish your scenes, um, how to develop your characters. And I learned all that. Um, while I was writing the Cyclops conspiracy. So I've hopefully taken some of that knowledge and, and translated it into these second and third and hopefully the fourth books. That's great. Yeah, there's so much learning curve there. And you learned about the plot. Could you go into some of the other mistakes you learned publishing the first book that you can use moving forward um, outside of learning about how to plot it properly? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, with the Cyclops conspiracy, as I said, I think I, I worked on it for about four and a half years. When it was done, my, my manuscript, the one that I had completed, was over a thousand pages long. Yeah. And um, my wife, or my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, um, had a friend in Florida who was going to read it for me. And so for the first question that she asked was, well, how long is it? And when we told her it was a thousand pages, she said, don't even bother sending it. It's way too long. So that's when I contract contracted with an editor and um, got them to give me a lot of good feedback. Um, and I, I was overwriting. I was, I was taking my scenes and my, um, you know, descriptions of characters and descriptions of what was going on and uh, in and around the characters was way too much. It was overboard. So he taught me how to cut that back. He taught me how to start scenes and right in the middle of a scene rather than developing, you know, working up to the, 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 the dramatic points. Uh, he also taught me to leave um, your readers hanging at the end of every scene, whether it's a scene break or a chapter or, um, or a major part, always leave them with a question, what's going to happen next? And that's the key to hopefully having a book that's a page turner. So those, those are some of the major, major um, points that I learned. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of smaller points that I've learned over the way that, uh, over the course of time, but um, I'd have to 
I'd have to jot down some notes to tell you what those are. Yeah, sure. So between uh, publishing Second Chance Second um, and then the next six years, how did it work out that there was that gap before publishing your second Cyclops book? And also, did you like, was part of that story sort of written through right, the process of writing your first one? You know, so like how, just how did that whole process unfold? And I think that you know, depending on what you're going to say, um, it's not so much to say, well, gee, there was this big gap between your first and second in the series, but rather to encourage anyone who feels like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't have my second one done or how am I going to get it done that, you know, just to keep on going, which is what you did. But, but what was the rest of that story for you? Sure. No. Uh, yeah. There, there is a significant time lapse between Second Chance and the Cyclops Revenge. Part of it has to do with um, some personal things. As I said, I divorced my son's mom. So I was going through some personal issues that were in, in, inhibiting my ability to, to write all the time. Uh, those have obviously have been resolved. Um, and also, I needed to do um, more research for the Cyclops Revenge than I did for um, the Cyclops conspiracy. Um, I'm a pharmacist by trade, as you mentioned in the, in the bio. Um, I've been a pharmacist for 35 years. So, you know, the things that are pharmacy related in my stories and all of my books are pharmacy related. All, they're, they all revol revolve around pharmacist protagonists, kind of like um, John Grisham writes about lawyers and there's numerous doctors out there that write about uh, physicians. I have yet to see, other than myself, a pharmacist who writes about the profession of pharmacy. So there are somewhat medical uh, suspense pharmacy thrillers. Um, and when I was writing The Cyclops Conspiracy, I had to get into um, legal uh, issues, you know, detective issues, crim criminology, um, international intrigue. And as a pharmacist, I had very little experience with that. With the Cyclops Revenge, uh, there was a lot more of that in, in the story. So I had to spend some time uh, researching that in addition to um, finding time to write. So that, that's one of the reasons for the gap. Now, the Cyclops series is actually going to be a series of four books I already have the title for the next one, which is going to be called The Cyclops Reprisal. I have the book cover already designed, and awesome. that book is about, mm, I want to say about 50%. The manuscript is about 50% done. Awesome. And then the final book in that series is going to be called The Cyclops Holocaust. So all of that six-year gap had something to do with developing these final three stories. Which, yeah, and just from the book marketing side of it, um, as you well know, it, it, the second book gives you a chance to market the first one, and then same thing with the third one, and so you pick up new readers all along the way, as, well as some of your original readers get a chance to go back and refresh on the book that they enjoyed in preparation for the next mm -hmm. one. Yeah, so I love all of that, that you kept on going, that you kept developing, and that the story, you know, the story from what I, I am not personally a fiction writer. My husband is both of my, our, our kids, kids are aspiring fiction writers, uh, not yet published. And so I live around it all the time. And I see that and she's a, to her credit, she's very good at helping us edit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and fill in some of the blanks. But what I see is that the, the stories can take on a life of their own. They don't stop because the writer has put down his pen, you know, his figurative pen um, or because of the end of the book. In fact, they, they grow, you know, they really, begin to grow and 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 I love that you know you as a pharmacist you're writing your your hero basically of your novels as a pharmacist that just makes so much sense and it it makes what you can bring to it so much richer you know than if we were if the writer was having to research the whole thing yeah. you know all together and that reminds me I am in preparing for this interview I discovered that Agatha Christie was a pharmacist uh, as yeah. She was. That's why a lot of her stories, and I think that's on my web, a little bit of that is on my website. She actually did dabble in pharmacy to some degree. So sometimes a lot of her stories and plots deal with poisonings and medications and things like that. Right. So obviously there's an influence there. That's true. Yeah. And also O. Henry, author of Gift of the Magi. Uh -huh. um, 
was uh, a pharmacist as well. He, he, that was not his real name. That was his pen name. I don't remember his real name right offhand, but I'll put mm -hmm. it in the notes. So, so that's cool to know that you're in good company with very famous pharmacist authors. They are few and far between, you know. So you should so you should go down in the archives of history as one of the pharmacist authors over time. But I would we have some questions from uh, one of our. Um, I create daily members, uh, community members, as well as in the audience. In fact, she is uh, one of your customers as a pharmacist, which is how we discovered you. Uh, so Lynn, Lynn Hunley told us all about you so that we were really grateful for that. And she has some questions, but before we get to, to those and others from our audience, I, you mentioned that you have a publishing company. So tell us more about that. Well, um, yes, uh, a little bit of history about that. I, after I finished the Cyclops Conspiracy, as every author does, the first thing you do after your manuscript is done is you start sending out query letters to agents and publishers, and you're, you're looking to find someone to put your book out there. Um, and I had actually contracted with a company called Synergy Books in Austin, Texas, um, and they contracted to publish my book. So I was really, really excited. Um, and I sent them the manuscript, their editors and their people were working on it. They probably worked on it for about 10 months. Um, and after about 10 months, I stopped hearing from them. Now we were doing a lot of this work, most of this work through phone calls and emails. I didn't actually um, meet any of these folks. Um, and what happened was they stopped calling me. So I started to get a little bit concerned. One of the reasons I chose Synergy Books is because I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, this. He's a reporter. His name was Jack Ford. He used to he used to be on NBC. He published a book through them called the Osiris Alliance. So I said, well, if they published Jack Ford's stuff. Well, and they, they're, they're probably a good company. And of course, after sending out hundreds and hundreds of query letters, this was the first offer I had. So I was ready to jump at it. And so after not hearing from them for about three or four weeks, I decided to do some research. And so I Google mapped the address in Austin, Texas, and I saw where it was. And then I saw a neighboring business, and it happened to be like an electrical contractor. So I called up the gentleman at the electrical <laughs> contract place, and I said, would you mind going across the street and telling me what's going on with Synergy Books? So he said, sure, no problem. So he, uh, he called me back about an hour later. He says, I got bad news for you. There's a, there's a note on the door. They went out of business. Yikes. I was like, oh, my goodness. So I was devastated. Now, they had my manuscript. They had my cover art. They had pretty much everything. So I thought I had lost all of it. Wow. Luckily, after about four or five weeks, I got all of the information through the bankruptcy court. I got the manuscript back. I got all my cover art back. So I had another decision to make. I was like, okay, do I go through this process one more time and see if I can find a publisher? And I said, no. And, you know, the self-publishing world has started to explode. And it was right around that time when that, that was happening. So I said, no, I'm going to do this myself. But rather than contract with like um, the Amazon folks or some of these other um, self-publishing houses, I created my own publishing company. I did some research and I told the folks at my um, printing company in Ohio, I said, I want my hardcover novels to look like they belong on the shelf right next to John Grisham and Robert Ludlum and all those other folks. And they, I said, can you do that? I said, because we're going to do hardcover. We're not doing paperback. Now we did, we started with hardcover and my books are also out in paperback. They're also in eBooks and they're also on audio. Awesome. So when they told me they could do that, they sent me some samples of their work. I said, okay, we're going to do it. So I contracted with them and um, I created my own company. And, and uh, you know, for lack of a better saying, I guess the rest is history. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of how, how that came about. It was through a, um, my initial failure in terms of uh, getting published through um, Synergy Books. Right. Fantastic. One, one of those failure to success stories. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, I love that. That's wonderful. So are you publishing, are you using that company to publish just your books or, or are, you, are you also planning on publishing other authors through that company? I don't, um, I don't advertise or I, at least I have not gotten to that point yet. Um, 
but yes, I am. I do actually do some consulting work a little bit on the side to work with authors. I've pub, I've uh, edited a few uh, authors' books to get them more marketable, so to speak. So I've done some of that for them. I'm actually working with a gentleman right now to get his um, um, book published. It's not fiction. It's more of a nonfiction self-help kind of book. So I am doing some of that, although I am not aggressively marketing it myself. Although at some point, maybe we might, we might see that. Makes sense. Awesome. So yeah, uh, so we have some audience questions and Lynn wanted to know, she had a lot of questions for you. And so she wants to know where you get your ideas and how you think of the plots. Uh, well, I, a lot of my ideas come from working in the pharmacy industry. I'll have a particular situation happen in the pharmacy. I'm, I actually have two have had two careers as a pharmacist. My uh, first 11 years of my career, I was a hospital pharmacist. And my book, Second Chance, is about a hospital pharmacist named Alex Benedict. Uh, the second half of my career, uh, I've been a community pharmacist, a retail pharmacist, and that's where uh, Cyclops Conspiracy and Cyclops Revenge are kind of based. So I do get a lot of my ideas uh, from things that happen at work. Um, I have a ton of them. I have a, I have a notebook this thick of all the different ideas that I've, uh, I have for plot twists or things that can happen in a book or maybe what my next book will be about. Um, and we mentioned earlier that, you know, the creativity doesn't always flow when you want it to. So I, I carry a notebook with me wherever I go. And when I'm at work and I might be working in the pharmacy, something will hit me and I'll just jot down a little note about this is what I, I want to investigate this at some point. So I do get a lot of ideas from things that happen as a pharmacist. I also get other ideas from what I read. You know, I, I still read um, a lot of suspense thrillers. Michael Crichton's a big, I've been a big fan of Michael Crichton, Robert Ludlum, um, Vince Flynn. Uh, is a, I, I read a lot of his books. Daniel Silva. I uh, just finished reading his book, The House of Spies. So I do get some ideas about plotting and, and I look at say, how other authors do that to get get some inspiration. Yeah. Oh, so that's a good thing. I wanted to ask people who write books. Do you, when you write books now, as a published, several time published author yourself, are you able to really sink into the story or are you constantly looking at it as I know what they're doing, like the mechanical angle of writing a book where you're very aware of sort of the journey the author is taking you through when you're reading, when you're else's. reading somebody else's. Um, when I, when I'm writing, I get lost in the story. Um, oh, cool. I, I totally get lost. I will. I'm, I'm one of those people who, I will try to plan everything out. I have a to-do list about three pages long every day. Um, so I will try to plot out my stories. Uh, but I found with each book that I've written, um, usually after about 25 to 50 pages of trying to follow my story outline, the characters or the story will just take go off on a tangent. And it'll go in places that I had never envisioned that it would go. Um, so even though I spend all these hours trying to plot the stories, uh, it doesn't always go where I want it to go, but that's because the character says, no, this is, this is where I need to go, not where you want to take me. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I read other um, authors, um, I do take that into account. Sometimes I can, I can see why the author did a particular thing. Um, and as you guys probably understand, when you're writing fiction, anything that happens in your story has to advance the plot. If, you know, I think Anton Chekhov, the famous Russian playwright, said, if you show a gun in the first act of your play, the gun better go off in act three. So you have everything that you do in your stories has to somehow be connected to your plot. So I think that's, that's like a Russian piece of advice. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Um, and so you did touch a bit earlier on how you stay committed and it's just... Um, showing up writing having those deadlines and another question that lynn had was do you start the next book before you finish your current one do you have multiple projects in the air well with the cyclops series yes um as i mentioned the cyclops reprisal which is book number three in this series is about 50 percent complete 
Um, I do have some more research I have to do before I can finish that one. Um, and I have made notes about the Cyclops Holocaust. So even though I have not written anything in forms of a manuscript for Cyclops Holocaust, I do have some ideas as to what is going to happen. I do have some plot um, notes that I have made. Um, as far as am I writing, doing more than one project at a time, I tend not to because I do still work as a pharmacist. Um, I, I don't have time to juggle multiple literary balls, so to speak. Yeah, that makes sense. And so um, what do you do? Another audience question is, what do you do when the editor wants to take out a part that you love? So have you encountered that? Like, I know you had to change the title um, of the, the Cyclops, the first Cyclops book. Have there been any of that or anything like that that's been hard for you to agree to? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a that's a very good question. You know, as authors, we can become very uh, married to everything that we write on paper. So it's sometimes when somebody and one of the one uh, other note we were talking about editors earlier. Um, anyone who's ever read any of my work, as far as I'm concerned, they're all editors because they all have plenty of feedback for you. So everyone is everyone is an editor. Um, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, with the Cyclops conspiracy, I was such a neophyte in terms of um, the writing process. The, and my editor, his name is David Compton, he was brutal. I took, he took my 1,000-page manuscript, and he probably had it for about, I don't know, four months, and he returned it to me with about a 50-page um, uh, cut. You know, he had 50 pages of comments where he said, and he and he told me at the beginning, he said, I'm not going to tell you what you're doing right. If you're doing it right, I'm not going to say anything. He said, if you're not doing it right, then I'm going to let you know. And after I read his 50-page uh, commentary on my 1,000-page manuscript, I was literally in tears. I was like, I'm never going to be able to do this. Um, I will say this, though. I took 90% of his feedback and I incorporated it into my work and it made me a much, much better writer. So even though it was a brutal process to go through, uh, it was a, it was a very, uh, it was a growth experience. Um, with the second book, I incorporated a lot of what I learned, um, in that. So I sent actually my second book to him as well. And the feedback I got was only five pages. So I think I did a pretty good job. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, when my editor recommends something, if he says, I really think you ought to look at this, I will look at it long and hard. Um, and I will probably take, a, you know, most of the time I will take their suggestions, especially because he's been, he's been spot on on some of his, uh, on some of his critiques. Now, if it's something I feel strongly about, it stays as again, uh, I'm a, I'm a self-published person. I publish through my own company. So I have the final say as to what goes in. So I bear, but I also bear full responsibility for how it turns out. Absolutely. One of the things I love about your editor story is that that process, you know, that, that, that you were the student and you were paying for his services. So that was your tuition. And that's far more productive in my mind than if you had gone to to four years of university with a literary degree you know or a writing degree it's like you know you learned in real time with real work that you created and that process was you know your tuition and you wrestled through to the other side of better you and know, a great a result. tangible result of yeah. a book after yeah i mean from 50 to five pages you know do the math yeah. that was exponential progress you know True. So, it's very insightful that you should say that because, um, you know, as a pharmacist, I have a bachelor's degree in pharmacy and a lot of pharmacists these days, well, actually um, a doctorate is now the entry level degree. Back when I graduated from pharmacy school back in 1983, it was a bachelor's degree, but now it's a doctorate. So they go to school two or three years more than I went to school back in 1983. And I said to myself when I was writing, the before I started this whole process, I said, I'm going to use this as my postgraduate um, experience. So how you, the fact that you hit on that was exactly what I told myself. I'm going to use this as my postgraduate um, doctorate, so to speak. Absolutely. And it's so important to, for any new author that, 
or somebody who's contemplating publishing a book is to really find an editor who can be brutally honest because your first book is like don't ever expect your first book to be like completely launch you into complete success yes it could happen it's a great vision to have right but there's yeah, right <laughs> right <laughs> but don't expect yeah. that like you, there's a lot to learn and a, no matter how old you are there's so much to learn about the process of and what a successful book looks like or sounds like or feels like to the reader and you can see how in that process uh, how you will get faster. You know, you'll be able to produce, you know, uh, like your, so your second book's coming out February 1st of 2018, and you have an estimated time for your third book in that series. We're hoping to have it out um, by late 2019. So we're hoping for the fall of 2019. Okay, so yeah, so you've got your writing schedule and you're gonna just keep on getting it. You know, who knows, you might even be able to do it earlier. You know? Maybe, we'll see. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about goals, you know, that can kind of force that deadline. Well, kind of since thing. you mentioned that, do you ever see yourself becoming a full-time writer? I would love to do that. I would definitely love to do that. Um, my, my writing pays for itself, um, but it's not to the point yet where I can, you know, venture off um, and quit my job. Nice. Um, and that's something that's important for um, creators to understand is that there are a lot of writers out there. And I, I you know, I, I can't speak to artists, you know, who, who paint and draw and other, other types of um, uh, motifs, so to speak. But there are a lot of writers out there who don't, aren't able to, to sustain their, their work without having a, a job on their own. And that's perfectly okay. Um, we all aspire to that. You know, we definitely aspire to that. Um, but one of the things I'm happy with is that um, it does pay for itself. So the sales from one book will pay for what happens with the next book. And, and I get to put a little bit, little bit of money in the bank. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's just you're basically just starting. So the next book, like we talked about earlier, will give leverage to the first and the second book, you know, then. And so it, you know, you're building a body of work that becomes a bigger and bigger platform uh, right. to stand on and be seen from as well as earn from. So that's all coming. Yeah. And as as a writer. And again, this is true of all creators. Uh, anything that you do, and, and I speak from a writing standpoint, the books that I write, the stories that I write, they're all very personal. Not in terms of they're not, you know, autobiographical, but you've worked really hard on this project. You've put your heart and soul into this manuscript. And then you go out and you're going to try to have folks read it. And, you know, some some folks can be brutal. So as creators, we have to have a very thick skin um, and we have to understand that not everybody's going to like your work some everyone's going to have some kind of uh, feedback for how you can do it better um, and I have I learned very quickly that uh, you have to be prepared for that you have to be prepared to accept that feedback now one rule that I have is if somebody comes to me and says I didn't like your story and you know I, I that's been rare um, so most of the folks that read my books are fairly happy with them, but some folks have come back and said, I really didn't like it. And that's fine. Um, if they can give me a good reason as to why they didn't like it, if they can, you know, sit down and analyze and say, well, I, I didn't like what the character did here. Or I thought he should have done that. Then I will kind of take that in and maybe use it to improve what I do the next time. If somebody just comes out, I've had some folks rarely slam me and say, I just, this was I didn't like this, mm -hmm. then I just kind of, you have to, you kind of just have to set that aside. If somebody can give you some good feedback as to what you need to do differently, then you try to maybe take that to heart. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, it's like any, like any kind of relationship, you know, where not everybody gets along with everybody. And so what works for one doesn't work for the other, exactly. um, you know, and then when it comes to feedback, that's such a, uh, a balancing act for creatives because you want to, um, receive the feedback that can make you a better writer um, without compromising, you know, without compromising your art as your art mm -hmm. versus morphing it into something that's not a part of you as well. Because in other words, you have to love it too. <laughs> that's true. 
That's exactly right. That's so yeah, that's my advice to all creators out there. Just you have to have thick skin and you have to plow forward and don't don't ever give up. Yeah, definitely. Well, and that's great advice. Now you've shared already your daily habits. So that's continued through with the second book writing and the third, right? Where mm -hmm. you basically write in the morning and in the evening after work. Um, yes, yes. I will try to get up early and write in the mornings and, um, depending on how stressful my day was, um, that I will also try to write in the evenings. Yeah. Um, and on a day off, I will, you know, I'll definitely be putting in some extra pages rather than, um, having a, sometimes a daily goal. I mean, the goal is to write every day. There's no question about that. Uh, the amount of material that I write every day changes from day to day. So what I've done is make it a weekly goal. I want to have 30 pages done by the end of the week. So if I only get two pages done on Monday, then I want to make sure I'm, I'm having more pages done towards the end of the week. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Are you using any particular kind of uh, goals journal or a tracking system for that? Or are you just doing, you know, like uh, your legal pad kind of thing or no, I just, you know, I just look at where I started on the week. I'll write down the page number we're on. And then at the end of the week, I'll look at the page number we're on and see if I've accomplished my goal. And usually I'm checking it during the week. So I know if I'm on track or not and whether I need to push a little harder. Are you using uh, anything like Scrivener for writing or are you using Word docs? What are you using? I use just, I just use Microsoft Word. I, and I, I usually plot with um, index cards. I'll try to do... Uh, you know, lay out my scenes as I'm plotting the book with index cards. But again, um, as I said, usually by the time I'm to, um, to page 25 or 50, those are all being rearranged and tossed out and things like that. Yeah, definitely. Well, your uh, conspiracy kind of stories taking place in the pharmaceutical industry, I'm sure we'll have some of your customers wondering, you know, which pieces of that that you you gleaned from your current location versus you know you know this the thing about writers the warning around writers is be careful you might get written into the story well i, I tell my family that all the time <laughs> <laughs> it can be a threat or it can be something like also yeah. depending on the person and the time of day and what they do yeah like like what happened in the you know in this in the book where there's somebody died you know something to do with medicine it's like well did that really happen in the hospital setting right you'll leave your readers wondering about some of that too and who was the character really about when you wrote it <laughs> yes. <that they> died <laughs> i'll tell you a little anecdote uh with regards to uh the cyclops conspiracy there's a character in there who's a private detective named walter or Waterhouse and my dad's name is Walter yeah. so when the book first came out um, everybody just assumed because his name was Walter Waterhouse that I was writing about my dad which is not the case I just used the name I guess because I like that name because it's my dad's name I still get emails from long-lost cousins who say I can't believe you killed off Uncle Walter in the book <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> that is funny. Is your dad still with with still living? He is. He is. Okay. So he didn't take it personally either. <laughs> no, no, he did not. He did not. Of course, my mom was the first one to say that. I can't believe you killed dad off in the book. Yeah. But you know, occasionally I'll have a, a long lost family member saying, I can't believe you did that. Yeah, definitely. Well, we want to be respectful of your time and not keep you much longer. Is there, is there any final um, tips or of inspiration for aspiring writers uh, that's been a part of your journey that you'd like to share? You've already shared a, a good bit. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the only thing I would share is, uh, for, and it's the same advice most, most writers that hear, um, don't ever give up. You have to believe in yourself, number one. Your work um, is important and it can be uh, very successful and you're the only one who can really champion it. So you have to believe in it. And no matter how many times you hear the word, you hear the word, you say, say no, um, you have to just fight through that. Yeah. You have to fight through that. And, and we have to fight through our own no's as well. Mm -hmm. You know that, in fact, they want to, you want to share, you were just, um, uh, something you heard on a podcast or you were, you know, in the audio book. Oh yeah. yeah I was, uh, yeah. So I was listening to, you know, those motivational, uh, clips on YouTube, um, where they have like the thematic theatrical music and then, mm -hmm. you know, talking and there was, they, they, 
grabbed a snippet of a lady who was talking about, and this it was backed up by science, and they were talking about how if you don't, you have a five second window to um, commit and move on something that's important to you. And in that five second window, if you don't take action, your brain automatically discards it. So, and she was talking about this in relation to her breaking her habit and waking up earlier. And she's like, it takes like, in that five second window, you have five seconds to decide, I'm going to hit the snooze button and go back to bed, which further establishes the negative habit. Or I'm not going to hit snooze, I'm going to get up before I have time to think, you know, and then that's reinforcing a positive habit. So you, so when you're telling yourself no, or when you're deciding to do something monumental, or even something as small as sitting your butt in the chair and doing the work, it's like, those five seconds really, really, really matter and are extremely important in wiring your brain to build positive habits. And because the rest of that is if, you, if you're going to do it, five seconds is all you need. And if you don't, then the brain is naturally wired to begin finding reasons not to, mm-hmm. especially when it comes to effort. Yeah. That's true. And, I, and in my experience as a pharmacist, um, along those same lines, if, my understanding is that if you can – decide you're going to say yes and I'm going to do that within that five seconds and you can do that for 21 consecutive days that can usually break the pattern or you can usually establish a new pattern if you can do it for 21 consecutive days I don't know how scientifically valid that is but it seems to work and I've heard that one other note with regards to the word no I'm just to pass along a little story my son when I first wrote the Cyclops Conspiracy and I was working on the manuscript, it was top secret. Nobody knew about it. My son didn't know about it. Um, and m- myself and maybe one other person knew that I was writing the manuscript. And one of the reasons for that was is because I had no idea where this was going to go. I didn't want everyone asking me, when's the book coming out? When's the book coming out? So I just kept it totally secret. One day he discovered that I was writing the book because he saw the papers all over the desk. And then he saw, uh, and it was actually um, after I'd finished the manuscript and I started sending out letters to the agents. And there was the stack of emails from literary agents that said, thanks, but no thanks, we're not interested. And he was looking at it and he said, dad, how can you put up with all hearing all these no's? And I told him, and it was kind of insightful at the time, and, and I still live by it. I said, no doesn't mean no. It just means later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, I heard that yeah. in, in a podcast I was just listening to by with Tim Ferriss. Uh, and it also means exactly what you said and that it, mean, it might mean no for that person at that Correct. point in time. You know, so it's like, again, and, and I think it had to do with the book publishing as well. Uh, and it had to do with, so that story didn't strike that person at that point in time. So I, I know I said we needed to go, but I just remembered one more thing I wanted to ask you. Sure. Uh, your assistant was, um, was to, uh, when we were setting this up, at one point your assistant said you were out of town going on location to, to interview someone relative to something in a story, I think. Does that ring a bell? That like so vaguely, have- yes, it vaguely does ring a bell. Um, and I don't reason- remember where I was going. I think I was interviewing somebody with regards to um, someone who works at a pharmaceutical company, a pharmaceutical plant, and it has to do with the, not not the Cyclops Revenge, but the Cyclops Reprisal, which is uh, coming out. Well, as we said, hopefully in 2019. Um, I believe that's I believe that's where I was. I've been I've been away two or three different times um, since we've set up this appointment. So that may have been it. So yeah, well, the reason I was wondering is is because I wonder do you do so you have done some of that like on location research interviews what have you? Uh, do you do much of that? Do you plan to do more of that? I love to do that. That is that is the most uh, the most exciting part of doing some of this. Um, um, when I wrote Second Chance, I visited a couple of local hospitals because I had been out of uh, hospital pharmacy for 10 or 15 years. And mm-hmm. I was astounded at how much the, the technology and the way things are done in hospitals has changed. So I had to re-educate myself with that. So, I mean, it makes you a much not just a better writer, but it makes you a much more well-rounded person when you visit a location. Um, if you're writing about, uh, let's say, Washington, D.C., or um, 
you know, something that's going on here and here locally in, in the, the Tidewater, Virginia area. So um, I love to do that. I do it whenever I possibly can. It's that getting up from behind the desk kind of scenario as well that stimulates new ideas and connections. So, yeah. yeah. As I said, a lot of times when I run into that writer's block where I don't have anything to say or can't put any words on the page, I find that it's probably because I haven't done enough research. So mm -hmm. um, that helps. That yeah. definitely when you know helps. a topic, when you, whether you're writing about something completely fictitious and have to make it up from your head or writing about stuff you already know about in whatever form, uh, the more you know or the more experiences you have to pull from it's you're just sort of you're more like regurgitating an experience as opposed to like actually making something up completely making brand new, new which is a lot harder it reminds me absolutely Joanna, absolutely Joanna, if you, if, uh, sorry if you're, on, if you're on location and you're you're looking at a particular scene or looking at a location it's so much easier to write about rather than making it up in your head you're yeah, absolutely definitely. right and Joanna Penn of The Creative Penn, a very prolific fiction author, uh, says that she can't not go to a city when she's traveling without immediately coming up with story ideas relative to that. So, you know, again, it's like... <laughs> that reminds me, too, I was listening to another podcast, not to keep dragging this on, but there's so many funny stories. But the, um... I'm having a great time. We're, yeah. we're good on time. Don't worry about me. So, um, <laughs> we are, too. The, the Dan Brown, he was interviewed on some quick podcast it was like a 12 minute thing and he said that though one time he went to a place in Italy and he saw a staircase like it was like a a long dark staircase and he was like somebody's gonna die there in one of my scenes <laughs> I just thought that was so funny it's like you can't shut it off when you're a creative yeah. everything inspires yeah. you or everything can serve as a catalyst for some future inspiration because you'll be thinking about something and you'll be like oh remember that time when that would be so interesting to write about yeah so, Absolutely. It reminds me, I think that uh, uh, just the concept that the muse, the creative muse lives in the doing, mm -hmm. you know, it does. It definitely does. Well, well, I just, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I just wanted to put in a, a one final plug if it's okay. And, Absolutely. And who listens yeah. to the podcast or here's the, here's the, your video podcast to check out my books at davidperrybooks.com. And I, I will put out this offer to anyone who's a creator who is interested in, I do like to help other authors get to being published. Um, and if they do want some insight or some help, I am, I'm available. I definitely love to hear from them. I, again, I don't advertise it. I don't have a website for it, but if any, anybody's interested, I would definitely love to talk to them about it. Okay. Awesome. Wonderful. We'll put all your links uh, as well as the book in the show notes for the podcast. Um, we'll keep you posted on when it airs and we'll definitely make sure your books are shown showcased and we wow. were looking forward to the release and just congratulations. Yeah. And thank, you. and thank you so much for sharing your story and your advice and wisdom and everything with us. Yes. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, we're, we're doing this again in a couple of weeks, aren't That's we? Great. That's right. After the release of the, um, your third book. So yeah, the conspiracy, I mean, sorry, the Cyclops revenge. Um, so we're looking, we're looking forward to that and you can share some of your stories of the new release. Very good. I hope, hopefully by then I'll have had a, maybe a book signing or two so I can maybe yeah. share some of that. Yeah. And send some pictures. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do. I've enjoyed this very much. Look forward to it again. Same here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.